Hello everyone, this is Joshua Spodek. At the core of my leadership teaching and the core of my leadership practice is something that I call the model, which is my model for the human emotional system. Plumbers work on, they use wrenches to work with pipes, carpenters work with their tools to work on wood, and leaders work with emotions to work with people. So if you know the human emotional system, if you have a good understanding of it and a way to use it, then that's a very strong uh, tool for you as a leader. And not understanding the human emotional system is, is really going to hamper you in terms of self-awareness. When we talk about self-awareness, it's really about your emotions and your emotional system. In my course, I give a, uh, a presentation on the model, and it generally seems very well received. Outside the course on my blog, I've written about it in writing, and now I've decided to make the presentation available for everyone. So this is a free presentation that I'm going to put on my blog, and it's a resource for people who read my blog, also people who read my books on leadership, and people who took my, take my leadership courses. This is a video series on mental models. Now, a lot of times I say mental models, sometimes I say models, sometimes I say beliefs. I use them interchangeably. So if I, use, if I switch around between them, that's just because I naturally do that. Mental model, model, belief, same thing for me. When I say the model and it's in italics like that, it means my model for the human emotional system. And that's what we're, we're gonna cover over the next bunch of uh, presentations. And the method is how to use the model for your own personal and professional development and also to lead others. This video, the first one, is about mental models in general. So what mental models are, how we use them, how to use them, things like that, how to be aware of them. The model, a follow-up video, is gonna be about the model of the human emotional system, useful for leadership. And the method is a way to use the model for personal and professional development and to lead others. This is part of my books on leadership and my courses, Leadership Step-by-Step Step and Fundamentals of Hustling. These are available at spodekacademy.com, so I urge you to go over there if you want to learn more and to be able to use these. You know, this is really the tip of the iceberg. The courses give you a full comprehensive program of how to use them, and you can see testimonials and things like that, but uh, that's another thing. I'll let you get to that on your own. So I want to start off by giving some context. The example I'd like to start with is the three stone cutters. This is a parable that I came across by reading a book by Peter Drucker, the famous writer on management and leadership. And so he told this parable in his book, The Practice of Management, which came out in the 50s. Many years ago, a passerby saw three workers cutting stones in a quarry. Though they were doing similar work, one looked unhappy, another looked content, and the third looked overjoyed. The passerby asked them what they were doing. The unhappy stone cutter replied, I'm doing what it takes to make a living. The content one answered, I'm a stonemason practicing my craft. And the overjoyed one looked up with a visionary glance and said, I'm building the greatest cathedral in the land. And so I want to point out, these stonemasons were all doing the same thing. Presumably they had reasonably similar abilities. And so what accounts for the difference between one of them being unhappy, one being, okay, content, not bad, and one of them being overjoyed? So the big question that comes up is, how can I become like the third stonemason? How can I be overjoyed if I'm doing the same thing as someone else? I'd rather be happier. I mean, given the choice between miserable and happy, wouldn't you rather be happy? What makes the difference? And this presentation is about what makes those differences. Okay, so that's a parable. It's interesting. Let's talk some real life examples. I'm gonna talk about three books by three authors, which are among the most influential and inspirational books that I've read, and they line up as some of the most inspirational books that anybody's read. So one of them is The Diving Bell and the, and the Butterfly by Jean-Dominique Bobby, which is also a movie. Next is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, listed by many as one of the top 10 books of the 20th century, and Gimp by Mark Zupan. So I'm going to talk about each one in turn. So first I want to talk about Jean-Dominique Bobby's Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Jean-Dominique Bobby, the editor-in-chief of, of Elle magazine, uh, by the way, this is in France, suffered a stroke and lapsed into a coma. He awoke 20 days later, aware of his surroundings, but paralyzed with the exception of some movement in his head and eyes. Eventually, it was just his left eyelid that he was able to blink. The book was written by him blinking his left eyelid, taking 10 months, four hours a day. A transcriber had to recite the alphabet, going A, B, C, D, except it was the, in the French order of descending, you know, starting with E and then R and then S, whatever the most common letters of the alphabet were, until he blinked, and blinking meaning that's the next letter. So the book took about 200,000 blinks at two minutes per word. And what was the result? Published in 1997 to excellent reviews, becoming a number one bestseller. It was adapted into a, an award-winning movie. I think it won the top award con that year. Total sales are now in the millions. I would not want what happened to him to happen to me. But what happened to him, it enabled him to write a book. And what was this book about? Would you be, I mean, I wouldn't want to live like that, but how was it for him living like that? And I should point out, the diving bell for him, me in the title, means 
it's a big, heavy thing. A diving bell is what you lower uh, divers into so they can breathe underwater. It's a big iron, big, very heavy thing. And that represented his body in the book. And the butterfly represented his mind, which he, could flitter, which he could flit around all over the world and do whatever he wanted with, because that's what he had available. So in the book he writes, my diving bell becomes less oppressive, and my mind takes flight like a butterfly. There's so much you can do. You can wander off in space or in time, set out for Tierra del Fuego or for King Midas' court. You can visit the woman you love, slide down beside her and stroke her still sleeping face. You can build castles in Spain, steal the Golden Fleece, discover Atlantis, realize your childhood dreams and adult ambitions. This doesn't sound to me like someone who's living a miserable existence. It sounds to me like he's figured out a way to be the, the third stone cutter, to make his life what he wants it to be, independent of what hand it was dealt. So let's hold on to that one for a second. Let's look at Viktor Frankl. So this book, as I mentioned, is widely regarded as one of the top 10 books of the 20th century. Viktor Frankl, MD, PhD, he was a professor of neurology and psychiatry at the University of Vienna Medical School. I understand that he was a contemporary or learned from Freud. 1940 to 1942, he was the director of the neurological department of the Rothschild Hospital. Career going well. 1942, the Nazis deport him, his wife, and his parents to a ghetto. And in 1944, he and his wife were transported to Auschwitz, without question one of the worst environments humans have created for other humans. And so what happened to him there? From the book, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. That is to say, in as miserable an environment as you could imagine, people went around helping others, comforting them, giving away their last pieces of bread, even when they're on the board of life and death, not having enough food to eat. He continues, when we are no longer able to change a situation, just think of an incurable disease such as inoperable cancer, we are challenged to change ourself, ourselves. That is to say, he found a way to become the third stonemason in an environment no one would wish on anybody else. So continuing, he writes about his experience. We stumbled on in the darkness. This is when the Nazis are forcing them to march, torturing them over big stones, through large puddles, along the one road leading from the camp. The accompanying guards kept shouting at us and driving us with the butts of their rifles. Anyone with very sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arm. Hardly a word was spoken. Icy wind did not encourage talk. Hiding his mouth behind his upturned collar, the man marching next to me suddenly whisper, or whispered suddenly, if our wives could see us now, I do hope they're better off in their camps and don't know what is happening to us. So this is a terrible situation. So what's going on? That's what's going on physically. What's going on mentally? In fact, wh where does this man's search for meaning come from? We'll see in the next passage. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw truth, the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth, that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I understood how a man who has nothing left in this world may still know bliss, be it only for a brief moment, in the contemplation of his beloved. So no one would want to be where he was. But look at what he was able to make of it. And you and I, we're almost certainly in, in material situations that are far more desirable than his. Are we able to live the way that he is? Are we able to find meaning like he is? Mark Zupan was a rising soccer star, an American, and doing very well. And then he was asleep in the back of a friend's pickup truck. There was a drunk driving accident. He was asleep and got thrown out of the vehicle and almost died. He lost partial control in all four of his limbs. So what happened to him? From the book, after a while, after his, re after his recovery, he realized that he wasn't going to be able to walk again. He said, I was starting to get my head around the fact that this was all the recovery I was going to experience. This was as good as it was going to get for me. This realization didn't hit me all at once like a bolt of lightning. It was more like a gradual process that took several months. I had made myself stronger, but I hadn't regained function in quite some time. At this stage in my life, it was obvious to me that I was never going to run again. This made me incredibly sad, but there was also some small relief in finally knowing what my body could and couldn't do. Rather than fight an impossible battle, one that was beyond my ability to win, I chose instead to focus on the life that was within my grasp, and that life happened to be in a chair. You can say I was surrendering to my injury, but I chose to look at it another way. I was surrendering to my desire to live a happy, fulfilling life. I would say to be the third stonemason. When I first arrived in the hospital, I was almost fully paralyzed. Two years later, I could bench 200 pounds. I could walk close to three quarters of a mile in my crutches, with my crutches. I'd skydived, I'd crowd surfed. I'd realized that most roadblocks existed only in my mind. But my physical limitations were different, they were real. By accepting them, I wasn't admitting defeat. 
If I related all the shock back to my old ideas of winning and losing, I guess I was declaring myself a winner once and for all. It just had taken me some time to recognize what victory was going to look like for me. So it sounds to me like he spent some time as the first stonemason after the accident, saying this, he was living miserably. By his old self, by the person he used to be, where things are winning and losing, he, I believe he saw himself as a loser. And he changed his beliefs. He changed his way of looking at himself and the world and realized that he could declare himself a winner. Now wait, is he, is he just faking being happy? Is he just putting lipstick on a pig? Let's see what happened in his life. The crowd surfing was with his favorite band, Pearl Jam. And when you read the book, you realize that he, he, he tells how listening to Pearl Jam got him through some very difficult times. That was what inspired him. And he actually got brought on the stage by the band and played and sang with them. So after this realization, he won a Paralympic gold medal. He had played a major role in an Oscar-nominated movie called Murderball, which is how I heard about him in the first place. I highly recommend it. It won the Sundance, uh, an award at Sundance. He met the US president. He spoke to children and, groups and troops across the country about living in a wheelchair and, the, and how to be positive about it. He was interviewed on The Tonight Show and all sorts of other shows. And I believe that they interviewed a bunch of people on the movie Murderball, other people who, were, who had lost control of at least some control on all, of, all four of their limbs. And I think he was one of them that when they asked him, if you could go back and do it again, what would you change? And I believe he said, I would not change it. My life is better now than it would have been had I not had that accident. This is a major change. This is being a cathedral builder. Now, Jean-Dominique Bobby, Victor Frankl, and Mark Zupan, they became cathedral builders. They made their lives what they wanted it to be. And I want to point out, none of them planned or prepared these accidents. None of them planned or prepared for what happened to them to happen to them. They made do with what they had. None of them had superhuman abilities. They didn't do anything that you or I could not do. It was not necessary. The accidents, the crucibles, the experiences that they went through, they were not necessary. They didn't create new abilities in them. They revealed what we all already have. And so if we don't need those accidents to happen to us, we can have similar improvements to our lives from where we are already. So understanding the human emotional system and how to use it will give you the ability to do what they did for yourself, to make your life as great as you want it to be. That's what this presentation is about. Let's talk about models. We'll talk about models in general on our way to talking about the model. So a model is, for, for this presentation, I, I use this definition for model, a simplified representation of something for a purpose. And each of those words is important. So first, simplified. When we see something out in the world, we can't put the entire thing in our minds. It's too complex. And besides, it's connected to everything else in the world. And once you separate it from something else, you're dealing with a, rep a simplified representation, meaning you threw out information. Throwing out information means whatever it, your mind's representation of the thing is less than the actual thing. And you're going to throw out some things. Other people are going to throw out other things. So there are biases that are introduced each time each person makes the representation. So if you and I both see the same tree, I represent in my mind one way. That representation is not the tree. You represent it another way, so we have different ideas about that tree. We'll get into this more in, as this goes on. And the example I like to use is a map. No, every map has it in the corner. It says something like one inch equals one mile. No map says one mile equals one mile. They're all smaller. OK, so we make it smaller, so it makes it more convenient. So a map, even though it's not the actual thing that it represents, it's very useful. You can carry a map around with you. Also, different maps are useful for different purposes. If I want to drive around Manhattan, I'm going to get a road map that shows the streets. If I want to take a subway around Manhattan, I get a subway map, which has a lot less detail. There are a lot fewer subway lines than there are streets in the city. Throwing out information makes it more useful. So throwing out information is not a bad thing. A map being not identical or not accurate sometimes makes it, makes it more useful. How we measure a map's value is how it serves its purpose. So it's very important. A lot of people reject models because they think it's not accurate, not realizing that's not what makes it good or bad. It's how well it serves a purpose. For a purpose, a model's utility is based on its purpose, not accuracy. OK, I think I just covered that. So a model that's useful for one purpose may not be useful for another. Or likewise, a model that's not useful at some time may be very useful at another time. We'll get into examples of that later. Let's look at a couple examples of models. Now, I come, from, I come from a science background. Science uses models a lot. So here we have a picture of the Earth and the Moon. This is a model of the Earth and a model of the Moon. I think this would be very useful if I wanted to find out the angular size of the moon from the Earth. Because if I look here, I see, here's this little angle here. I know, if I know the distance and I know the size of the moon, then I can calculate the angular size of the moon. Okay, a very useful model. How accurate is it? It's terrible. 
for one thing, the Earth is way bigger than this. The Earth is the size of the Earth, and this is this little thing that's the size of, of a coin. The Earth doesn't have the word Earth on it. It doesn't have all these lines all over it. It's not two-dimensional. It is a full sphere, not, this is only a semicircle. The moon, this is nowhere near the ratio of the size of the moon to the size of the Earth and the distance between them. So this model is terribly inaccurate, and if your measure was accuracy, this would be a terrible model. If your model is utility, this is actually a very useful model. Let's look at another one. Here's a model where the Earth is just a little point with the letter S nearby. The sun is another point. The moon is another point. Okay, so the sizes are all off. It also has this big circle going around the orbit of the moon. That circle doesn't exist. There's no circle around with the, that the moon follows. It just moves around. Again, here's another model that's not accurate, but makes it more useful. Let's look at another one. Here's one. So this one has the Earth is just this horizontal line. So if you guys remember from high school or college physics, you might have done free body diagrams like this. And so this is a terrible representation of the Earth as just this little line, but very useful. I mean, the reason you probably recognize this, this type of diagram is you probably used one before because we've all used them and they're very useful. Terribly inaccurate, very useful. Here's another. This would be maybe more useful if you wanted to study geography or plate tectonics or something like that. Could be very useful. Also, highly stylized. There's no cutout of the Earth like that. Here's another with magma. I'm not sure what this one would be useful for. Here's another that might be more useful for ecology. And so all these models are very different from each other. Each of them is useful for some purpose and very unuseful for other purposes. None of them are particularly accurate. And so these are examples of models. These are very abstract ones. So let's look at ones that are more related to the types of mental models that we have in our minds. So here's one that a person might have. Life is like chess. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who think life is like chess. Say you're going in to negotiate with someone, a salary or a deal. If you think life is like chess, you might walk in there and think to yourself, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. The more that I win, the more the other person loses. You might think strategy. I want to create strategies for, to win. Or you might think, I go, then the other person goes, then I go, then the other person goes. So it's turn by turn. A lot of people do that. They walk into negotiations, figuring life is like chess, and they do that. Here's another model. Life is like surfing. Sometimes I have this model in my head. So if you think life is like surfing, you might not think of strategy. You might not think of, I do this, they do that, I do this, they do that. Or winning and losing, you might think this is, there are going to be big forces of nature, big things happening, and I'm going to ride them. And maybe my goal is to have fun and to enjoy them. Not to win, but to enjoy. So two, two people who are identical in every way, except for this one model, might go into the same situation and behave very differently. Let's look at an, another example. So when I was a kid growing up, carbohydrates were seen as healthy. And now it seems that carbohydrates are seen as unhealthy. So two people who behave exactly the same when faced with, I don't know, if you gave them an apple, one of them might not like it and one of them might like it. Both of them, I, want, I point this example out because both of them might feel they have scientific evidence backing them up. In fact, it might be the same person at different times. So you can see how different models can be, can be backed up and believed very strongly by large portions of the population and yet lead to very different behavior. Both people or everyone having each belief, though the d beliefs are different, they might have the same feeling of science proves me right or I'm correct. Here's another example. There's an old parable about a shoe company wants to move into a new market and they've never been there before. So they send two salespeople to go check out that market. One of them goes there and they walk around and they see that in this particular place, nobody wears shoes. And the person thinks, well, we sell shoes and here nobody wears shoes. So this is not a very good market for us. So they come back and report, there are no shoes, no one wears shoes here. So there's no market for us. The other one goes, sees the exact same information, sees all the same people, comes back and says, no one wears shoes here. It's a huge market. We can sell to everybody. Maybe you think the second one's the better model. I'm not sure. It might depend. Maybe the culture just will not buy shoes, and the first one is actually the more efficient, the more effective one. I'm not sure. My point here is just that two different people can have different models and lead to very different predictions and behaviors. And here's one that I see a lot. As a coach, I have a lot of clients who come to me, and they want to do things they've never done before. And so a lot of them say, I just can't do X, where X is, I don't know, be a leader sell stuff, start a company. So they say, I just can't do X. I'm just not the type. It may be accurate. I can't do X. Just because you can't do it now doesn't mean you can't do it ever. Michael Jordan once couldn't play basketball. Now I can. OK, so the way you say things can affect how you view the world. So let's look at another way of saying something similar. Someone could, might say, if he can do X, so can I. So maybe you think I can't do something. But maybe if you see that someone else can do it, maybe that could mean that you can too. So two different models. I can't do X. If he can do it, so can I. Both of them have some accuracy to them. All right, so let's give you some illustrations about models. Still kind of abstract. I want to go into a little more depth with a couple models. 
why he or she didn't call. So the example here is, imagine someone tells you on Monday, I'm going to get back to you by Friday. And you expect a call by Friday, and Friday comes around, come, and by the end of day Friday, you don't get the call. We've all been there. So what happens when that happens? It's different every time, but most of the time for me, and a lot of people that, that I talk to, you kind of fill in the gaps. You figure, they must have had a reason for not calling me, and you guess at what that reason might be. And there's lots of reasons it could be, but a lot of people don't recognize that they're filling in the gaps with information that they don't, they're making up. So when you don't really know, you create a model that could apply. Not everyone, but mo a lot of times people do this. And even if you don't, you know what I, I, I think you know what I'm talking about. So what happens is that you think the person didn't call for this reason or the person didn't call for that reason. And once you think you know that reason, you respond to that reason as if it really happened. So the way I put this in my terminology is you create a model and then you, that model leads to a strategy. Now, I don't mean strategy like you create a strategy like generals going to war, like I'm going to do this. If they do that, I'll do this. I just mean you behave in a way that you think is the best way for yourself given the situation. And given one model, you're going to have a particular way of behaving that you think is best, and that's going to be your strategy. A different person with a different model would have a different strategy. So here's some examples. If your model, if you believe that the person didn't call because they didn't care about you, like they think, they think you're a loser. Some of us think that way if we're, if we're feeling bad or feeling uh, uh, insecure. And the, the resulting strategy may be defensive. Retaliation, we want to get back at them. They don't think much of us. Well, I don't think that much of them. So if they called, you look at your phone, you see that they're calling. Now it's maybe Saturday. You might pick up the phone and say, if you don't like me, I don't like you, you jerk. I'm sure we've, you've done something like that or you've thought about doing something like that. If that was really the case, that action might be effective. Well, let's see what else it could have been. You might form a model that this person does care and really does want to call, but maybe you figure something must have come up. Maybe a relative was sick or maybe they got slammed with so much work that you understand why they wouldn't call. It's possible. And if that was the case, you might, under, you might try to be understanding with that person. So the behavior, the action that might happen is when they called, you might pick up and say, it sounds like you're really busy. Tell me about it. Or well, it's possible that somewhere along the way, maybe Wednesday comes around, you haven't heard from them, and you start thinking to yourself, I'm busy too. That could be a model, I'm busy. And you get on with your life, and so you put that behind them, and so by, behind you, and so by Friday, or Saturday, if they call, you might see them and call, and you pick up and you say, oh my God, that's right, you were supposed to call me, I totally forgot about that, let's, let's catch up, what, what's, what's up? Three totally different behaviors based on the exact same information, with you, or whoever it is, filling in the details. And I want to point out, say it happened that the person really didn't care about you, and was really dismissing you. They think you're a loser. But when they call, you believed that the reason they weren't calling was the second model, that, they thought, that you thought they were so busy that they didn't have time? You might pick up and say, it sounds like you must have been really busy. Tell me about it. What was going on? And they might think, oh, you are so magnanimous and so cool about this. They might start behaving as if that was the case, even if it wasn't. So sometimes it's the case that you behave in a way that makes the others fall into your model, even if it wasn't the model that they were using beforehand, or wasn't what happened. It can happen the other way, too. Your model could be accurate, and you can behave in a way that makes it seem inaccurate. So what can we learn from this perspective? Some lessons are that models inevitably influence our perception and behavior. There's no way of getting around it. The universe stretches on for billions of light years in every direction, and you have access to the smallest, tiniest fraction of that. There's so much that you don't know. And every part of the universe is connected, every, uh, every other part of the universe. And any part that you throw out means that you're not taking the whole thing into account. So your model is always, your models are always influencing how you see things. And it's always less than what's actually out there. Everything you see goes through that filter. Models lead to strategies. You always want to do what's best in some way at the time. And your perception leads you to see the world a certain way. So you're going to behave in a way that's consistent with that perception. That's a strategy. We often have a little justification for them. We just think, oh, the person isn't calling for this or that reason. We don't actually ask ourselves, what evidence do we have for that? Or what other possibilities could fit in there? So we often have little justification for these models or these beliefs. OK, let's look at another model or another, another situation. This is my model. I like to think models filter your perception. I've actually already been saying that. So I believe that models filter your perception. Maybe you disagree. I'm not sure. Maybe you have access to absolute reality in a way that I don't. But I think that you have to see things through your eyes and ears and through your senses, and that your models intercept the signals, and you don't get the actual everything, but you get a, a filtered version of it. So let's say you and I were both in a room, and there's a pit bull in front of us. And let's say you had a pet pit bull growing up, and you thought these were cuddly and adorable, and you really liked them. But let's say I was once bitten by one, and I think that they're dangerous. So there's you over there, and there's the pit bull, and you say it's cuddly, adorable, friendly, and playful. I might look at the exact same dog and say it's mean and dangerous. 
same information, different perception, based on different models, based on different past histories. We don't usually notice beliefs. We just believe the world is how we perceive it. You see a dog and think the dog itself is mean, or friendly, and I see the dog and I think the dog itself is mean. But let's say you, based on thinking it was friendly, behaved friendly and you went toward it and it was friendly as a result of you behaving friendly toward it. You could also imagine that if I started behaving anxious and started backing away from it nervously, it might read my, nerv my nervousness, my anxiety, and it might growl and start moving toward me menacingly. It could be the exact same dog responding differently to people behaving differently. So this model suggests to me a strategy that is always, I put in the words, always interpret everything positively. And what I mean by positively is when I think of all the possible models that I could have in a, in a moment, I think how would each model lead me to live my life and how would people respond to me and what would lead to the best outcome based on what my values and how I could imagine things working out. Obviously, I can't think of everything, but I think of what I can. And this, mo this strategy has worked very well for me. Always interpret everything positively. And so I believe that this model is, is right, that models filter your perception. And I want to reinforce this concept here. When the strategy rewards me, I feel the model is true and I act without thinking about it. And this, is ha this happens to everybody. When you have a model, a belief about the world, and it leads to a certain expectation, and that expectation happens, we tend to believe that that's true. Now, this is nowhere near a mathematical or logical proof that something is true, but I believe that that, that is how our minds work. When you expect something to happen, and it does, you believe that what the beliefs that led to that expectation are true, and you don't really think about them. You just think, you don't think about it. That just seems to you that's a part of the world. So I can poke holes in this model, that mo this belief that models filter your perception, but any alternative would be just as flawed. Like I said, every model has biases and simplifications. So the lessons here are that we can choose models based on predicted outcomes. A lot of people think the first belief you have is the belief you should have. Anything else is, is like putting lipstick on a pig or changing things. Actually, I found that the first model is often flawed because you haven't had a chance to think about it and think about different ways of looking at it, asking other people what their models are and so forth. But the point here is just that we can choose our beliefs based on predicted outcomes. And what I find works best when you have different models that you could choose from, choosing based on what outcome best meets your values best improves your life as far as I can tell. So again, I don't have anyone else's experiences but my own, but in my experience, when I choose my models, I do it based on what is going to lead to the best outcome that I can think of. In other words, always interpret everything positively. Models feel true when their outcome rewards us, when the expectation is met. It feels rewarding, and that makes it feel true. This one is everybody does their best based on their view of the world and their ability. So I think everybody in the world is walking around, and whatever they're doing, they're always viewing the world and subject to their interpretation based on their beliefs, and they do what they think is best. Now, sometimes it looks like someone's not doing their best. I'm sure you've done projects where someone else wasn't contributing as much as everybody else, or they were bringing you down or something like that, or you've been in situations where people are kind of half-assing it. Now, a lot of people look at them and say, they're lazy, or they're idiots, or something like that. I used to talk like that, but this model that everybody does their best has told me that when someone seems like they're lazy, I think they're probably doing their best. Because I know that there have been times when, pe when people have looked at me and said I was being lazy, but I know that I wasn't being lazy. I was doing the best that I could, given that I had other constraints that were taking my time from other things, and I did do the best I could, given the finite resources that I had. Well, that excuse works for me every time, because it's not an excuse, it's an explanation for me, because I know the situation, I am doing my best. And so why don't I give others the benefit of the same doubt? I presume that others, if they look to me like they're not doing their best, maybe they have different values, maybe they have different perceptions of the world, maybe they have different abilities, but instead of responding with saying they're lazy or they're boring or they're... Um, uh, they're idiots or something like that, I think to myself, there must be something, some view of the world that they have that I don't. I become curious. What leads them to behave in a way that I would probably behave if I were in the same situation? Now look, maybe you're sitting there saying, no, Josh, some people really are idiots. Okay, maybe that's the case. That model works for you. I have a different model. So what does that lead me? Oh, so some people disagree. I should say, whenever someone says some people are idiots, they never say I'm an idiot. I'm talking about themselves. So they always, the, the, the reasons for them appearing lazy or like an idiot, they always have an excuse that works for them. So everyone always says the other person they, they, they judge or condemn. No one ever says it about themselves. Or if they do, they're saying, it, oh, I'm lazy, but they're not saying it. They're kind of like not really condemning themselves. Anyway, so it leads to a strategy for me, which is that don't look for blame, but take responsibility for improving things to the extent that you can. Now, I'm not going to go into, the, into depth about this strategy, but this strategy has been tremendously successful for me. Instead of blaming others, instead of judging, 
This has been a major shift for me, not judging other people. Instead, just looking at the situation how it is and moving on as best I can. I find it tremendously effective as a leader. And why don't I look for blame? Because if I take for granted that if I were in the other person's situation and I viewed the world as they did and not how I do and I had the abilities that they do and not that I do, then I would do the same thing. And how can I blame someone for doing what I would do? Now, this model may work for you, it may not. I'm not sure. I'm just telling you this is a model and I'm just going in more depth. I'm not trying to convince you to try to adopt it, although it's worked very well for me. So this strategy seems to explain behavior better than categorizing and blaming people. So I tend to feel that the model is true. I just think that people do the best they can. It's possible that there are people who don't, but this model still works for me. I don't know if you've read the book Freakonomics, but it's a book about how explaining people's behavior based on the incentives around them, looking at you know, the finite resources and how resources are distributed you know, from an economic perspective. And they put it very well. In their words, they said, people are people and they respond to incentives. So that's it. Basically, people have the same motivations and desires and so forth. And if you want to understand why they do what they do, look at their incentives. So you may feel differently. I'm just pointing out this is a model. And then here's a real life one, an actual person. I like to talk about this one. It was uh, a little after I graduated from business school. A classmate of mine, I ran into her, and she told me how she was looking forward to, as a consultant, she had her next project was going to be in Mexico City, and she had been studying Spanish, and she was looking forward to get the chance to be in an immersive environment to practice her Spanish. So she was looking forward to going to Mexico City. A few months later, I ran into her again, and I said, how's Mexico City? And she goes, you know, it's a weird thing. We, I have not gotten there yet. I said, why not? I thought you were going right away. And she said, yeah, things keep coming up. There's all these little projects that have to happen before we go, and we haven't gotten there yet. So I didn't think much of it. And we talked about other stuff and went on our way. And then a few months after that, I ran into her again. And I said, what happened with Mexico City? Have you gotten your chance to go there? And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, what happened? She said, here's what happened. The other, it was a two-person team, and the other person on the team, her mother was telling her that Mexico City was dangerous. Believing that Mexico City was dangerous, or perhaps not wanting to have her mother involved, instead of telling the engagement manager, the person who managed both of these two team members, instead of sharing that she wasn't behaving, or that she was behaving, that she was worried about going to Mexico City, she just threw up a lot of roadblocks. Like she would have visa problems, she'd have budget issues, she'd have passport problems. And that led the, the team, this two-person team, to be unable to go to Mexico City. The key person here, in my opinion, is the engagement manager, the person who managed this two-person team. This person was, had authority and is, the, is in a leadership position, but was not taking on a leadership role, which was to realize that two different people, actually three if you include the mother, three different people had three different models for Mexico City. One saw it as an opportunity, one saw the mother saw it as a danger, the other teammate saw it as, I guess, a, a source of potential conflict with her mother or maybe a source of, of embarrassment with the team. If you're a leader, it's very important to recognize that different people have different models for the same thing and to be able to expose these differences and to act on them. If you don't recognize these differences are there, it's very difficult to work with them. Picture being a coach on a basketball team. Imagine one of the players is the star player and that, and that player believes he should get the ball all the time. Okay, say another player is, is, thinks that we should pass the ball a lot and move the ball around, to move the ball around a lot then that player might behave in a way that gets the star player really angry. If you're a coach and you don't realize that different players have different ways of, of perceiving the game, you're gonna have a really angry team on, on, on your hands and they're not gonna perform very well. Another role as a coach is to set the priorities or to set the, the beliefs equally, or at least compatibly. So that you, as a leader, set the tone, set the expectations, set the beliefs, mental models, models of your team members in order to be productive. So that's what we have to work with as leaders and why mental models are important. All of what we've talked about so far is what I call the passive view. I don't mean passive as bad or less than active. It's an important first step, is to realize that using models and beliefs is inevitable and necessary. Your environment is just too complex otherwise. Everybody is always using models all the time. Nobody has the entire universe wrapped up in their brain that they un understand perfectly. Because they're simplifications, they're all flawed, including yours. All models leave out information, are subject to your biases, and contradict each other. It's an, an inevitable consequence of throwing out information and introducing biases that are unique to you. Truth and rightness is defined within a model. So something that may be right according to you may be wrong according to somebody else. If you're looking for absolute right and absolute wrong and you don't have access to all the information in the universe, it's helpful as a leader to recognize that some people can see something as right and others can see something as wrong and they may disagree with you and from their perspective they may be just as right as you are from your perspective and neither may, may, may have the have perfect grasp of right and wrong. Convincing others that you're right tends to hamper leading. 
Leaders generally don't try to get people to agree on everything. They tend to get the job done. So models are valuable for achieving their purpose more than how right they are. We tend to accept evidence supporting the models that we have, our beliefs, and ignore contrary evidence. If I know some guy, Fred, and I think he's a funny guy, and half the time he's funny and half the time he's angry, I might see him, every time he makes a joke, I'm like, yep, that's Fred, he's a funny guy. And every time he gets angry, I think, that's weird, he's funny, but he's not acting funny right now. Well, whatever, he's a funny guy. You might think he's angry, and every time that he's angry, you think, that's Fred being angry again. And then the times when Fred is funny, you think, that's funny, he's, so, he's usually so angry, but now he's not. And you throw, throw out that information. You can call this confirmation bias. There's lots of other biases, and probably listeners know about lots of different biases that get introduced here, but that's just one. And you have to be aware that you introduce biases when you create them, however unintentionally, and then they re recreate other new biases. People tend to behave more consistently with their beliefs than what they say. In fact, they, I believe that they always behave consistently with their beliefs. Sometimes when they communicate, they might have a belief, but they might not want to share it. They might be embarrassed about it or not want to share it for other reasons. If that's the case, they will often communicate to you not their, actually belie their, their actual belief, but their belief mixed with what they want you to think about them, with their intended identity. So people don't always openly and honestly communicate their beliefs. They might not be aware of them. It's not like they're trying to deceive people. Sometimes they don't recognize. They just think the world is this way and it's not worth mentioning that they think it's that way and they might not recognize that other people feel differently. Why do I dwell on all models being so flawed? Why do I point out there are all these leaving out information and biases and stuff like that? The main reason is to promote flexibility. Like I said, when you, when you see something, you often create a model for it. The first, time, the first model that you create is not necessarily the most effective one for different purposes in different times. It's very useful to be flexible with your models. In fact, I once spoke to a psychologist. She, he, she studied intelligence. And we were talking about models, and she said flexibility is one of the key components of intelligence. I thought, that's weird. I don't think of flexibility in your mental models or your beliefs. Is, how does that connect with intelligence? And she said, a big part of intelligence is your ability to solve problems around you. Can you get through situations more effectively than different other people? The more problems you can solve, the more intelligent you are. And she said, sometimes there's, there are situations that one model doesn't, one, looking at it from one perspective, doesn't lead you to a solution. If that's the case and you can't change that model, you may never get to a solution to that. But if you can change your models, you may be able to come up to see the same situation from a different perspective, from a different belief, and get to a solution. So flexibility leads to intelligence. Flexibility allows you to solve situations that others couldn't. Flexibility allows you to work with people who might disagree with you. The flip side, the opposite of flexibility, what I would call fundamentalism or orthodoxy, being fixed in one perspective, is it can be helpful in some situations, but it's not very helpful when you're trying to lead others unless everybody agrees with you in every way, and that generally is not going to be the case. Also, people often nod approvingly when I'm in courses. They sit there and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, models, they're all, they're all flawed, they all have different, different people have different beliefs, and they understand how other people's beliefs or abstract beliefs may be flawed, but they resist seeing their own model's flaws. And this can get to be a big problem working with people if they believe that they're right, not just that they have a, a particular perspective. It can be very difficult to work with people like that. And people don't like having people on their teams who can't see other perspectives. So if you can't see other perspectives, people, you're not going to get opportunities. You're not going to get promotions. You're not going to get funding. You're not going to make sales that you could otherwise. Okay, I want to wrap this up with a couple examples of experts' models. So to give you an idea of how someone can feel so right, and I think when you see these examples, you'll say, if I were there with that person, I would have believed that they were right too. I think that there was a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, the chair of IBM in 1943. Some people listening to this have five computers within reach right now. Maybe two cell phones, a laptop, a desktop, and maybe a watch that may have more computing power than what got us to the moon and back. But in 1943, that wasn't the situation. The belief about what a computer was, computers filled up whole rooms at the time. They were for things like only huge banks and governments used for, not for playing games and things like that. If you could go back in time and say, you know, in the future, there's going to be billions of, com of computers all over the planet, people would laugh at you and say, what are you talking about? Listen to the guy from IBM. He knows what he's talking about. So we went to Atari and said, we'll give it to you. We just want to do it. Pay our salary. We'll come work for you. And they said, no. So then we went to Hewlett Packard. And they said, we don't need you. We haven't, you haven't even gotten through college yet. So this is Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computers, getting his start in the world. Now, he was saying, I'm going to be someone who makes something good of, you know, I'm going, to make, I'm going to be productive in personal computers. And from the perspective of Atari and Hewlett Packard, they didn't believe him. And well, who had money and who didn't at the time? Who was a, who was a successful company and who wasn't? Steve Jobs was nobody. 
It's hard to think of them that way now. Well, now, I don't even know if Atari exists anymore. Hewlett Packard is nothing like the size of Apple, and Apple came out of nowhere. But I think at the time, most people would have said, Steve Jobs is nobody, and why would we hire someone who doesn't have any background or anything like that? Go to college, get a degree. And so if you look at the story of how Google, Google got started, those guys were trying to sell their technology, the guys who founded Google, uh, Larry and Sergey, they were trying to sell their technology to Alta Vista and Excite and Yahoo and the big portals at the time. And I, my understanding, if I remember right, is that they were trying to sell their technology for $1 million. They couldn't sell it. The other guys didn't want it. Now they're worth billions. If something happened to them and they had only $1 million left, they'd, be, they'd think it was a huge disaster. 640K of RAM ought to be enough for anybody. That sounds crazy. If you had to deal with 640K RAM on anything, you couldn't do anything that you use your computer for now. But that was Bill Gates, founder and head of Microsoft in 1981. So he had a different model. He had a different belief of what computers did. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Warner of Warner Brothers in 1927. When was the last time a movie with no talking was out? But at that time, that belief made sense. And who would have, if you were back there and you were saying movies are going to be great with talking, would people have believed you or Warner? Stocks have reached what looked to be a permanently high plateau. Professor of economics at Yale, 1929, just before a decade-long depression. We don't like the sound and guitar music is on the way out. This is a record executive rejecting the Beatles in 1962, just before Beatlemania. Oops. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. You may not know the name of Lord Kelvin, but he was a huge physicist in the history of physics. And for him to say that, it's kind of funny because if you look at birds and bats and insects, these things are heavier than air and they're flying. Now, I mean, I bet everyone who's listening to this has flown in an airplane in the past year. So these are all models that were flawed. And if people at the time were able to get rid of these models and see things in a different way, they would have been able to move ahead a lot faster. Hewlett Packard might have had Steve Jobs working for them and all of Apple Computer might have been a small subset of Hewlett Packard, who knows? Flexibility is valuable. Oh, one more. Everything that can be invented has been invented. The commissioner of the US Patent Office. Well, I think we all, I, my perspective is that the more patents we have, the more patents we can have. That should wrap up all of the first view of the passive view of models. So I wanna thank you for this one. The next what we're gonna do is look at the active view of models, which is how to use models, how to change your beliefs, how to change looking at things in order to become more like Jean-Dominique Bobby or Viktor Frankl or Mark Zupan. We all have the capability of doing that. Now that we know what models and beliefs are, we can act on those things. So I'll see you at the next video.